In our discussion of environment and habit, we learned that the individual mind is amenable to the suggestions of environment, that the minds of the individuals of a crowd blend with one another, conforming to the suggestion of the prevailing influence of the leader or dominating figure. Mr. J. A. Fisk gives us an interesting account of the influence of mental suggestion in the revival meeting, which bears out the statement that the crowd mind blends into one, as follows. Mental Suggestion in the Revival Modern psychology has firmly established the fact that the greater part of the phenomena of the religious revival are psychical rather than spiritual in their nature, and abnormally psychical at that. The leading authorities recognized the fact that the mental excitement attendant upon the emotional appeals of the revivalist must be classified with the phenomena of hypnotic suggestion rather than with that of true religious experience. And those who have made a close study of the subject believe that instead of such excitement tending to elevate the mind and exalt the spirit of the individual, it serves to weaken and degrade the mind and prostitute the spirit by dragging it in the mud of abnormal psychic frenzy and emotional excess. In fact, by some careful observers, familiar with the respective phenomena, the religious revival meeting is classed with the public hypnotic entertainment as a typical example of psychic intoxication and hysterical excess. David Starr Jordan, Chancellor Emeritus of Leland Stanford University, says, Whiskey, cocaine, and alcohol bring temporary insanity, and so does a revival of religion. The late Professor William James of Harvard University, the eminent psychologist, says, Religious revivalism is more dangerous to the life of society than drunkenness. It should be unnecessary to state that in this lesson the term revival is used in the narrower signification, indicating the typical religious emotional excitement known by the term in question, and is not intended to apply to the older and respected religious experience designated by the same term, which was so highly revered among the Puritans, Lutherans, and others in the past. A standard reference work speaks of the general subject of the revival as follows. Revivals occur in all religions. When one takes place, a large number of persons who have been comparatively dead or indifferent to spiritual considerations, simultaneously or in quick succession, become alive to their importance, alter spiritually and morally, and act with exceeding zeal in converting others to their views. A Mohammedan revival takes the form of a return to the strict doctrines of the Quran and a desire to propagate them by the sword. A Christian minority living in the place is in danger of being massacred by the revivalists. Pentecostal effusion of the Holy Spirit produced a revival within the infant church, followed by numerous conversions from outside. Revivals, though not called by that name, occurred at intervals from apostolic times till the Reformation, the revivalists being sometimes so unsympathetically treated that they left the church and formed sects, while in other cases, and notably in those of the founders of the monastic orders, they were retained and acted on the church as a whole. The spiritual impulse which led to the Reformation, and the antagonistic one which produced or attended the rise of the Society of Jesus, were both revivalist. It is, however, too sudden increase of spiritual activity within the Protestant churches that the term revival is chiefly confined. The enterprise of the Wesleys and Whitfield in this country and England from 1738 onward was thoroughly revivalist. Since then, various revivals have from time to time occurred, and nearly all denominations aim at their production. The means adopted are prayer for the Holy Spirit, meetings continued night after night, often to a late hour, stirring addresses chiefly from the revivalist layman, and after meetings to deal with those impressed. Ultimately, it has been found that some of those apparently converted have been steadfast, others have fallen back, while deadness proportioned to the previous excitement temporarily prevails. Sometimes excitable persons at revival meetings utter piercing cries or even fall prostrate. These morbid manifestations are now discouraged and have in consequence become more rare. In order to understand the principle of the operation of mental suggestion in the revival meeting, we must first understand something of what is known as the psychology of the crowd. Psychologists are aware that the psychology of a crowd, considered as a whole, differs materially from that of the separate individuals composing that crowd. There is a crowd of separate individuals and a composite crowd in which the emotional natures of the units seem to blend and fuse. The change from the first-named crowd to the second, 
arises from the influence of earnest attention or deep emotional appeals or common interest. When this change occurs, the crowd becomes a composite individual, the degree of whose intelligence and emotional control is but little above that of its weakest member. This fact, startling as it may appear to the average reader, is well known and is admitted by the leading psychologists of the day, and many important essays and books have been written thereupon. The predominant characteristics of this composite-mindedness of a crowd are the evidences of extreme suggestibility, response to appeals of emotion, vivid imagination, and action arising from imitation, all of which are mental traits universally manifested by primitive man. In short, the crowd manifests atavism, or reversion to early racial traits. Diles, in his Psychology of the Aggregate Mind of an Audience, holds that the mind of an assemblage listening to a powerful speaker undergoes a curious process called fusion, by which the individuals in the audience, losing their personal traits for the time being, to a greater or less degree, are reduced, as it were, to a single individual, whose characteristics are those of an impulsive youth of twenty, imbued in general with high ideals, but lacking in reasoning, power, and will. Tard, the French psychologist, advances similar views. Professor Joseph Jastrow, in his Fact and Fable in Psychology, says, In the production of this state of mind, a factor as yet unmentioned plays a leading role, the power of mental contagion. Error, like truth, flourishes in crowds. At the heart of sympathy each finds a home. No form of contagion is so insidious in its outset, so difficult to check in its advance, so certain to leave germs that may at any moment reveal their pernicious power as a mental contagion, the contagion of fear, of panic, of fanaticism, of lawlessness, of superstition, of error. In brief, we must add to the many factors which contribute to deception the recognized lowering of critical ability, of the power of accurate observation, indeed, of rationality, which merely being one of a crowd induces. The conjurer finds it easy to perform to a large audience because, among other reasons, it is easier to arouse their admiration and sympathy, easier to make them forget themselves and enter into the uncritical spirit of wonderland. It would seem that in some respects the critical tone of an assembly, like the strength of a chain, is that of its weakest member. Professor Le Bon, in his The Crowd, says, the sentiments and ideas of all the persons in the gathering take one and the same direction, and their conscious personality vanishes. A collective mind is formed, doubtless transitory, by presenting very clearly marked characteristics. The gathering has become what, in the absence of a better expression, I will call an organized crowd, or, if the term be considered preferable, a psychological crowd. It forms a single being and is subjected to the law of the mental unity of crowds. The most striking peculiarity presented by a psychological crowd is the following. Whoever be the individuals that compose it, however like or unlike be their mode of life, their occupation, their character, or their intelligence, the fact that they have been transformed into a crowd puts them in possession of a sort of collective mind which makes them feel, think and act in a manner quite different from that in which each individual of them would feel, think and act, were he in a state of isolation. There are certain ideas and feelings which do not come into being or do not transform themselves into acts, except in the case of the individuals forming a crowd. In crowds it is stupidity and not mother wit that is accumulated. In the collective mind, the intellectual aptitudes of the individuals and in consequence their individuality is weakened. The most careful observations seem to prove that an individual immersed for some length of time in a crowd in action soon finds himself in a special state, which most resembles the state of fascination in which the hypnotized individual finds himself. The conscious personality has entirely vanished. Will and discernment are lost. All feelings and thoughts are bent in the direction determined by the hypnotizer. Under the influence of a suggestion, he will undertake the accomplishment of certain acts with irresistible impetuosity. This impetuosity is the more irresistible in the case of crowds, from the fact that, the suggestion being the same for all the individuals of the crowd, it gains in strength by reciprocity. Moreover, by the mere fact that he forms part of an organized crowd, 
a man descends several rungs in the ladder of civilization. Isolated, he may be a cultured individual. In a crowd, he is a barbarian, that is, a creature acting by instinct. He possesses the spontaneity, the violence, the ferocity, and also the enthusiasm and heroism of primitive beings, whom he further tends to resemble by the facility with which he allows himself to be induced to commit acts contrary to his most obvious interests and his best-known habits. An individual in a crowd is a grain of sand amid other grains of sand, which the wind stirs up at will. Professor Davenport, in his Primitive Traits in Religious Revivals, says, The mind of the crowd is strangely like that of primitive man. Most of the people in it may be far from primitive in emotion, in thought, in character. Nevertheless, the result tends always to be the same. Stimulation immediately begets action. Reason is in abeyance. The cool, rational speaker has little chance beside the skillful, emotional orator. The crowd thinks in images, and speech must take this form to be accessible to it. The images are not connected by any natural bond, and they take each other's place like the slides of a magic lantern. It follows from this, of course, that appeals to the imagination have paramount influence. The crowd is united and governed by emotion rather than by reason. Emotion is the natural bond, for men differ much less in this respect than in intellect. It is also true that in a crowd of a thousand men, the amount of emotion actually generated and existing is far greater than the sum which might conceivably be obtained by adding together the emotions of the individuals taken by themselves. The explanation of this is that the attention of the crowd is always directed either by the circumstances of the occasion or by the speaker to certain common ideas as salvation in religious gatherings and every individual in the gathering is stirred with emotion, not only because the idea or the shibboleth stirs him, but also because he is conscious that every other individual in the gathering believes in the idea or the shibboleth, and is stirred by it too. And this enormously increases the volume of his own emotion, and consequently the total volume of emotion in the crowd. As in the case of the primitive mind, imagination has unlocked the floodgates of emotion, which on occasion may become wild enthusiasm or demoniac frenzy. The student of suggestion will see that not only are the emotional members of a revival audience subject to the effect of the composite-mindedness arising from the psychology of the crowd, and are thereby weakened in resistive power, but that they are also brought under the influence of two other very potent forms of mental suggestion added to the powerful suggestion of authority exercised by the revivalist, which is exerted to its fullest along lines very similar to that of the professional hypnotist, is the suggestion of imitation exerted upon each individual by the combined force of the balance of the crowd.